My name is Lynn Dyer, and welcome to the National Armor and Cavalry Restoration Shop. The British tank behind me is a British Mark V Star. This particular tank was used by the American 301st Heavy Tank Battalion in the First World War. During the First World War, John Pershing realized the need for armored vehicles. He tasked Samuel D. Rockenbaugh to become the Chief of the Armor Corps, supporting the American Expeditionary Forces. It was broken down into three primary organizations. There was a light tank school at Sumer with the French Renault tanks at Sumer, and then they had the British Heavy Tank School at Bovington as a focal point for the heavy tank component, training with the British tank forces. The third component is the Tank Replacement School at Camp Colt, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Now, out of this, three individuals will be the primary leaders at each one of those schoolhouses. Captain Patton will be with the French Light Tank School, Major Ralph Sasse with the British Heavy Tank, and Captain Doy David Eisenhower will be with the Tank Replacement School. But for the British Heavy Tank system, they went through training in the United States as basic recruits, and then upon completion, the initial soldiers who went over there were out of the active army. They joined the British Training School at Bovington, where they started working with early model Mark IVs, which were very similar, but shorter than the vehicles that they're currently using. The American 301st was formed up and then joined the American forces in combat at the end of the war and specifically in the Meuse-Argonne campaign. Out of the campaign specifically there were a series of four primary battles that the vehicles were involved in and this particular vehicle is significant on the 29th of September 1918 in combat she was hit, she had casualties inside the vehicle and mechanically disabled to the point that she was never able to continue in the other battles. Luckily for her, that meant then that she was being salvaged and would then join the American forces returning to the United States where it came to Aberdeen Proving Ground for testing and evaluation and then was assigned back to the test and test development element out of the infantry school here at Fort Benning, Georgia. So when the tank detachment set up here, she's one of the few girls that came back with the American combat veterans to tar start training the infantry tankers that would be supporting the United States Army in the 1920s and 30s. This vehicle then spent the rest of its time at Fort Benning where it was used as a training aid as well as a backdrop for many photographs for the crews and staff that completed the training and then it went up to Fort Knox, Kentucky and joined the Patton Museum in 1940. Nine. And it was up inside the museum uh, from 1974 until it came down with the BRAC to return back to Fort Benning, Georgia. As a combat veteran, the British tank system is a little bit different than what the French ended up using. The vehicle is actually designed to either lead the attack with the infantry following in support or to have the infantry in front providing infantry support based upon the tactical situation. What makes her unique is the fact that she's got two sponset guns, British six-pounders, that generally are found originally on British ships. And when you look at a tank, there's a reason why there are so many nautical terms associated with the tank, because it was the British Admiralty under Winston Churchill that developed the heavy tank system. Hence, there are turrets, there are sponsets, there are cupolas, there's decks, there's hatches. All of those are nautical terms instead of those types of terms that you're going to find used within an infantry organization. Out of that, the cannons then, which came off the side of mostly British battle cruisers, were used for close-in defense. Those were inside sponsets, and there are a pair of sponsets on the left side and the right-hand side. Normally, you either have a male with the cannons, or you have a female that has machine guns in those places. Male tanks also did carry additional machine guns as well. So while she has a pair of six-pounders in the side sponsets, she also carries eight machine guns on her. 
a female tank would end up carrying 10 machine guns total. She carries a lot of main gun ammunition, approximately 280 main gun rounds, and almost 20,000 small arms rounds for the machine guns that she carries. With her being leading the infantry, she can end up breaching through a minefield and has no problem dealing with barbed wire obstacles because of the design. If track slippage occurs where she is moving across no man's land and starts to slip into a shell crater or gets mired, she carries generally an unditching beam that allows her to unditch from the mud and the dirt that she might potentially be slipping on. That way then she's got good mobility. In reality, the Mark V is equivalent to what the M1 Abrams is today. It is a vehicle with a lot of advanced technology. She has one of the first generations of long-range signal systems called a semaphore. She has an internal communication system using a ship form of technology like a blow tube where the captain of the ship talks to the engineer room. She also carries a doorbell on the back end, kind of like an infantry grunt box, where the back loader engineer can actually open up the back door and talk directly to the infantry from the rear of the tank. So the tank could be the shield in an attack and the point of the spear leading the infantry through the assault or follow up behind and support by fire as needed. Male tanks had the primary mission of taking out any other armored vehicles that did come out from the German side, as well as engaging pillboxes, bunkers, and machine gun nests. Female tanks primarily deal with machine gun nests and German infantry. Two different purposes for what the tanks have in the battlefield element, and there's usually a breakdown. A normal tank carries a crew of eight soldiers inside. It is commanded by a lieutenant. This particular vehicle, her serial number is 9591, was commanded by Lieutenant Hobbs on September 29th, 1918. And in the process, he's got a driver and a front machine gunner who end up engaging troops directly in front and steer the vehicle. He then has a sergeant or a corporal gunner in the left sponsor and the right sponsor with an individual loader working those two weapon systems. And then he is in the back turret on the Mark V star and then the rear person is a loader and again the engineer, but their primary purpose is to pass ammunition up for the gun systems to be employed. The armor protection on this vehicle is no more than a half an inch thick at the thickest part. Its primary purpose is to protect the crew against small arms ammunition that the Germans are shooting at it. Eventually, by the latter part of the war, it will become very vulnerable to anti-tank rifles, artillery pieces being shot at it, and then landmines that will disable the track. She's a very slow moving vehicle. She only moves at five miles per hour. She is powered by a Ricardo six cylinder engine, which is mounted in the center of the vehicle. Front station has the driver and a front machine gunner, and then you have a sponsor on the left and the right. Because of the location of the engine, the noise, the heat, and the exhaust all influence the personnel inside. And again, this is September of 1918, and their primary uniform they're wearing is wool. So those are contributing factors that will lead into developmental issues the Americans will look at leading towards the Mark 8 Liberty. Engine is in the front, transmission is in the back with long bars that actually shift it and control it, and then in the very, very, very back is the fuel for the vehicles. Some other elements that the vehicle has internally is she carries a set of water coolers inside, small little metal tins which hold about five gallons of water for the crew to drink. But they're also strategically located inside the vehicle near ammunition, so they help provide additional protection for that ammunition in a combat situation as well. The vehicle has no battery system, and it has a hand crank start to start her up. But she has one of the first generations of a generator that generates electricity for her lighting system. The commander also has a portable map board system that is back in the back tower with him. That in many cases is equivalent to 
the GPS type systems and some of the other tracking systems that are associated with the modern tanks using advanced technology for combat. The semaphore system was nothing more than a tower that came up through the top, or they would end up using flags to signal each other. One of the other interesting things is some of the British heavy tank units used carrier pigeons as long-range messengers, specifically when there was a need for shifting artillery fire, they could end up having a carrier pigeon carry a message relatively safely back to the artillery to tell them to shift or to stop the base of fire. I'm Lynn Dyer. Thank you for stopping by the shop. We'll see you next time.